changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. Good evening, my name is Nathan Daly. I teach biblical studies here at Heritage Christian University. And tonight I've been asked to talk to you about uh, the phrase Israel of God that we find in the book of Galatians. As we get started, I think what we'll do is we'll just start there in the book of Galatians and uh, read this text and use it as our jumping off point for, uh, for where we go. So let's start in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16. As for those who follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy upon the Israel of God. Now, Galatians 6.16, we're right at the end of uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians, and this is his kind of closing reference to those he's been writing to. He refers to them as the Israel of God. And interestingly enough, this phrase doesn't occur anywhere else in the Bible. Um, but uh, like uh, several other phrases that we do have in the New Testament, we have other phrases like the 12 tribes, um, chosen race, remnant, and other things that come from um, kind of Old Testament imagery that the New Testament writers then reappropriate to the church as they write these letters to them. And so what we want to do tonight is we want to ask, uh, why does Paul use this imagery here in Galatians for the church? Uh, what is he trying to get at? Um, what is he trying to help them understand about themselves? And of course, as we do that, we'll, we'll try to throw in a few things uh, for ourselves as well in terms of how this phrase uh, that's only used one time can also help us think a little bit about what it means to be the people of God today. So in order to do this, we're going to do a couple of things. One, we're going to try and run through the Old Testament narratives and look at some of the background that Paul is relying on as he's using this phrase. And then we're going to move on into the letter of Galatians. And this is kind of a uh, pinnacle point in the book of Galatians. It's right there at the end. Paul's been building up in his argument to get at this through, throughout the whole book. And so we're going to look at the entire book and some key verses that will help us understand this a little bit better. So as we do this... Um, and we'll, we'll start in the Old Testament. I want us to think for just a minute about um, just the concept of story. Because when we get to the Old Testament, we, we all know that in some sense, in very broad strokes, it creates this, this big story uh, that it tells us. And um, it's not just the Old Testament, but we all have stories like this that um, we live our lives within. So we have... We have small stories that when we meet someone new, we, we tell them uh, where we work or where we went to school. We tell them about our family and, and these things like that. But these create a context for us so that we can introduce ourselves in a, in a broad way to the people we meet. Uh, so those are the small stories that we tell, but we also have these big stories that we tell. Um, and these big stories deal with real issues of identity for us. And we all have these. Um, we think of ourselves in terms of our origin, uh, where we came from, what, what's our identity, who are we. Um, these can include our, our nationality or our ethnicity. Um, they can include our ancestry, and they can include a number of things that we might not think about every day but we all know that where we are in this world is a result of choices and actions, good and bad, by many people over a very long period of time. And that results in where we are today. In a sense, this is what's going on in the book of Galatians. The Galatians and those who have come to teach them have been focusing on this big story. What is the story? How do you tell it? And how do the decisions you make today about your religious life, your life before God, how are those impacted by who you understand yourself to be? So when Paul refers to the Galatian churches at the end of the book as the Israel of God, he's incorporating a very large story, and he's putting them into that. And he's making an argument that they should understand themselves as this. They should understand themselves as the Israel of God. 
Now this story, of course, we probably know it pretty well from the Old Testament. If we looked at the Old Testament as one big long story from uh, from creation at the beginning of Genesis to these promises that are made to Abram and Sarai in chapter 12 uh, and move on throughout Genesis. Once God gives these promises uh, uh, to Abram and Sarai, then every chapter of Genesis, uh, there's a problem. There's a crisis that occurs, and it seems like at every turn this promise isn't going to work. But of course, it continues on. And uh, we continue to read the storyline of the Old Testament through the Exodus, through Israel entering the land, uh, through life in the kingdom. And the kingdom is ultimately uh, split into two nations where uh, Israel becomes a northern uh, territory named Israel and a southern one named Judah. And both of these nations uh, end up in a sad end in exile at the hands of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Then when we get to the end of this New Testament story, some of them begin to come home and they begin to hope that their land will be restored, that things will be better, and that uh, they will be, again be this great nation that was promised in Genesis chapter 12. So as we read this broad storyline of Israel, much of it comes down to this concept of promise. And promise and fulfillment are really some of the driving forces that run us through uh, all of these Old Testament narratives. And it's that way because at the very beginning of the narrative in Genesis 12, uh, we have God's initial promise to Abram. And I'm going to read that uh, to you right now. It's Genesis 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in this initial promise that uh, God gives to Abram, uh, we have three particular elements of promise that we, that we find in there. Um, Abram is told that he's, he's to go to a land. Um, he's told that he's going to uh, be a great nation. And he's told that he will be a blessing, um, ultimately to all families of the earth. And within these three elements, Israel continues to define themselves throughout all of these uh, narrative texts of the Old Testament. Uh, they understand that God is one who gives promises, and God is one who fulfills promises, but they also understand, just like the stories of Abram show, that God doesn't fulfill promises immediately. God, God gives things to Abram, uh, maybe in terms of land, maybe he gets a well. Or, or a place to bury his wife, but it's not a great big piece of land. Much of these promises are only partially fulfilled for a long time, and this presents challenges and threats to Israel throughout their history as they look for the ultimate fulfillment of this promise. By the time Israel leaves Egypt, they are, they are known as this great nation. Uh, we can see this in places like Deuteronomy 26, verse 5. Uh, they're, they're called a great nation. They enter into the land. And, of course, this doesn't last very long because ultimately you end up with two nations. And after the time of David and Solomon, when Israel becomes northern Israel and Judah, Israel begins to hope that, again, that this promise will be made, will be made new in their lives, that they will be reunited, that they will be one great nation again. And you can go to various places and, and look at this, and I've, I've given you several examples in, in the study guide, so I won't read those now, but, but one of them I'll mention is Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel is told to carry out this symbolic act. Ezekiel is in exile at the hands of the Babylonians, and God tells him to pick up two sticks and write on the sticks, one of them, House of Israel, and one of them, House of Judah, and then tie them together, and of course this symbolically shows that uh, this promise of great nation, that these two places can ultimately be brought back together. Other chapters like uh, Jeremiah 33, the end of Obadiah, um, uh, Zechariah, Haggai both look at this issue. These prophetic texts consistently come back to this issue of Israel 
needs to be one great nation because that was the promise to Abram. Now, the reason we go through all of this is because this gives us the background to Paul's argument in the book of Galatians. And when we look at what Paul's writing in the book of Galatians, of course, it's a letter uh, to churches in the first century, and uh, clearly uh, they have a problem. Uh, Paul opens the book and just goes right into it. Uh, You can see this as early as uh, verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. So Paul goes right into the problem at the beginning of the book, and the problem is ultimately that he says he has come to Galatia and taught these churches, and yet now they have turned to a different gospel. Uh, Verse 7, not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And so let's look at a couple of other verses that kind of play into this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll pull all these together. Um, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. Um, or uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 2, Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be no benefit to you. Once again, I testify every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. Uh, You have fallen away from grace. And uh, one more uh, here leading up to our key verse uh, tonight. uh, Galatians uh, chapter 6 verse 14. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but new creation is everything. So apparently what we have going on in uh, the book of Galatians goes something like this. Paul comes to the Galatians and he teaches them the gospel. Um, He teaches them the message. And he leaves. And in the meantime, something happens. Uh, uh, Most likely, some others come in from outside Galatia or rise up from within it. And this is another group of Christians. And what these Christians are arguing, apparently because of the uh, several references we see to it in the book of Galatians, they're arguing that the Galatians, in order to be true Christians, in order to truly be the people of God, must be circumcised. And their claim is you do understand that the people of God comes from Abraham, and Abraham was circumcised, so you must be as well. Now, of course, as you know, Paul's argument in Galatians is grounded in the fact that he completely opposes this idea. Um, Of course, Paul uh, would say some some of these elements are are accurate, that yes, uh, we are uh, descendants of Abraham, which he argues in chapter 3. Uh, So all people involved in the book, all of our main characters, the Galatian Christians, those teachers who have come in from the outside, as well as Paul, they're all saying that we are to understand ourselves as being part of Abraham. And what they're doing is what we talked about earlier. They're defining themselves in terms of a story. They're trying to understand the nature of this big story in order to speak of their origins and then speak of how they are to act at the moment. This is the same thing we do when we read the Bible. We read this story, we try to, on the one hand, understand it, on the other hand, we try to place ourselves in it uh, so that we then act as the people of God uh, should act. So what happens in the scenario in Galatians is that Paul simply says, yes, but you've got the story wrong. And so he's going to try to um, restructure the story for his churches so that they'll again understand what it was that that Paul taught them in the first place. Um, The idea of being Abraham's child is not the issue. The issue is, how does a Gentile, uh, which is the people that uh, Paul is talking to here, the Galatians or Gentile churches, how does a Gentile become a child of Abraham? 
And what Paul is claiming through all this, since all this centers around uh, specifically the idea of circumcision, Paul is saying that what circumcision is, is an identity marker. It's something that shows you're Jewish. And um, whereas we know that Paul, by using the phrase Israel of God, uh, at the end of the book, is very concerned with creating continuity between the the Israelites in the Old Testament and the people of God in the New Testament, he's also very concerned about how people understand what their place is in terms of entering. And at Paul's time, circumcision has become something that it is, it's a, it's a badge of identity, it's a marker, it means you are Jewish. And Paul's claim is that these teachers are saying you have to first become Jewish in this way through circumcision before you can become a child of Abraham. And Paul says, you've missed the most important element of the story that I've been telling you the whole time. And so let's look at those elements of the story that he lays out here. The first one being in chapter 2, verse 16. So in Galatians 2, 16, uh, Paul says, we know that a person is justified not by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Jesus Christ so that we might be justified by faith in Christ. So being right with God, being justified, being made right, what is the act that causes one to be made right before God? Paul says in 2.16 that act is faith. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ here and we'll find out as we read through the book uh, what exactly that refers to and we find out uh, very clearly at the end of the book we're gonna we've already read this once but we'll read it again uh, chapter 6 verse 14 may I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything but new creation is everything. So what is Paul's story? What is the story that he's telling? He's saying that something happened at the death of Christ. And at the death of Christ, this something that happened was so big that it changed the entire world. Uh, You can see this in verse 15. Circumcision or uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. It's at this moment of Christ's death that newness takes place for the entire world. And here Paul specifically ties that to this issue that he's been dealing with in his churches, uh, which may not seem like an important issue to us, but it is a central issue in early Christianity in terms of identity. What does it take to join the people of God? So Paul says that this death, the death of Jesus, was so big and so important, it's a sign that everything changes. And why does everything change? Everything changes because Jesus has done something that seemingly can't be done. Jesus has defeated death. So in all of this, what happens, uh, look in chapter uh, chapter 3. Let's read verses um, 6 through 9. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, So you see that those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. And we've seen this before in Genesis chapter 12, of course. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham, who believed. And let's drop down to verse 14. In order that Jesus Christ, in order that through Jesus Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So, what is Paul arguing here? He's arguing that something has happened, something has changed, and that thing that has changed everything is the death of Christ. And after he left Galatia, these arguments that have arisen over what it means to be a part of the people of God have 
But what he says, they have nullified the importance of Christ's death. And what he wants his churches to do is again stand up and understand that it's the death of Christ that changes the world, that changes the way that we think about the story, and that gives us identity for who we are, and then ultimately results in what we have in chapter 3, verse 28. There is no longer Jew or Greek which is significant here in Paul's argument as he's been talking about circumcision. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So you see even here that as he says, all are one in Jesus, he again refers back to these promises that are made to Abram. And we're specifically supposed to be thinking about verse 3 right there, about how Abraham is promised that the blessing is not just for him, but the blessing will go to the nations. And so Paul is drawing off that idea to say, now is the time after the death of Christ that that the nations are truly coming in uh, as themselves into the people of God. So for Paul, it's this death of Christ that's the sole event. The death of Christ is everything that changes the world from old to new, that allows people to join the people of God, that allows people to join in the promise that God gave to Abraham, and ultimately allows Paul to say at the end of the book, peace be upon you and mercy upon the Israel of God. So for Paul, anything that detracts from that statement, from that act, that Jesus died and was raised, and that this is the foundation for understanding how someone enters into the people of God. Anything that detracts against that is equal to nullifying the important event that took place in Jesus' death. Okay, so throughout Galatians, Paul has used... um, he's, He's built up to this point where he can call uncircumcised Gentiles and circumcised Jews, he can call them both the Israel of God because they are supposed to come into the promises of Abraham through this all-important event of Jesus' death and solely upon that event. And so as we kind of pull this together, I'm going to leave you with a couple of things that you might want to talk about or think about in, uh, in relationship to this, uh, and to this idea here. I think one of the things that this exercise causes us to think about is uh, what does it mean to join in to a God, uh, join into the people of a God who makes promises. And that God makes promises in very surprising and unexpected ways, as you know from reading your Bibles. And and what does it mean uh, for us to be able to not... uh, just create our identity on what we know at the moment, but create our identity on the basis of a God who has made promises several thousand years ago. How does that change the way that we think about ourselves and what God is doing through us as a community, as the people of God? And this, of course, uh, this concept of promise leads us then to have to think about, uh, well, if there are promises and there is identity that's being shaped, uh, does that bring along with it any challenge? Does that bring along with it any obligation? And uh, this will take us again back to Genesis 12, 3, I think. So if we're going to think about being a, uh, being a part of Abraham, being descendants of Abraham, one of the things that Abraham is told at the end of that small section we read is that Abraham will ultimately be a blessing. So if you are a part of the promise, uh, what does it mean to be a blessing? How do we incorporate that into our story uh, and how we interact with each other and with everyone? And finally, and maybe, uh, maybe this is the thing that gets highlighted the most in Galatians, is that if we're recipients of this promise, do we ever identify ourselves on the basis of something other than the death of Christ. And that's going to be a tough one, I think, for all of us, because we all have customs, we all have preferences uh, that are built in the way that we understand ourselves as Christians. But one thing that Paul is arguing uh, 
if you let any of those customs or preferences define how someone enters the people of God, you have nullified the importance of Jesus' death. And that's a really significant challenge, I think, uh, that Christians have always had a problem with and probably always will. Um, it's a very tough thing for us to understand those things are so important to us, those preferences and customs that are so important to us, and making sure that we're not uh, putting those ahead of uh, what Paul writes about here, the importance of uh, the death of Jesus Christ. So ultimately, after we've gone through all this, what do we have? We find out that God has one people. God makes promises to one covenant people, and God, through Jesus' death, has made a passage for uh, all of us to enter into that one people. And then we can find our own purpose, we can find our own identity through being a part of this group, from being a part of this people, and we can tell our story as being part of the people of God, or as uh, Paul calls it in verse 16 of the last chapter, uh, the Israel of God. And it's within, it's within this, not within our custom, not within our identity. It's with only within the, the death of Jesus Christ uh, that we're able to say we are a part of God's people. We have come with open hearts Oh, let the ancient words impart Holy words of our faith Handed down to this age Came to us through sacrifice Oh, heed the 